There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hey everybody out there, welcome to another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I am your host, David Wilms, back from illness. Um, I'm <laughs> the, the sniffles? <laughs> that it was, I oh. was laid up. Those were the worst <laughs> sniffles ever, <laughs> Mike. I, yeah, you had sniffles. I, I heard you uh, saying <laughs> that I had sniffles, yes. yeah. yeah uh... Uh, it was, and it was, it was like a man cold. You know how you get that man <laughs> cold? Like it was a bona fide man cold. Yeah, and then like two days later we played basketball. Yeah, and I was hacking on everybody. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, not like the usual hacking, like you do yeah, foul. Right. Like I was just <laughs> like, like I do foul. Just right. shooting lung butter across the gym. <laughs> yeah, every time I cough. Disgusting. Yeah. Um, so thanks, you guys. Uh, Nephi's here too. We're all here. Um, thanks, you guys, for carrying it last week. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be here. I heard it was the most boring episode. Time has since heard. Yeah, since gerrymandering. <laughs> <laughs> Time has did have some, some critiques. He, yeah, uh, he actually yeah. thanked you for not uh, for not running as long as his commute because yeah, he thought right. he might fall asleep and run off the road. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, when I showed up at hunt camp this year, Time has found me quickly. Don't ever do gerrymandering again. <laughs> oh, okay. And we haven't. That's right. And we That's haven't. right, because it's not right to do gerrymandering. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is it right to do? It's right to talk about wacky bills. You know, so we did this last year around this time, and we thought it'd be fun to do it again. Not just wacky bills, but good bills, good, too. Because there's some good ones. Yeah, good, bad, crazy. Yep. Ba- basically, what we want to do, we've, we've got legislative sessions in or state legislatures in session all around the country right now. And with that comes uh, some good bills for hunting and wildlife uh, and and the outdoors and the shooting sports. Mm -hmm. And with that also comes some really bad bills. And we want to highlight both because there are some, you know, there's some good things happening out there to really you know, help advance hunting and, and fishing opportunities and get people out there and involved in the shooting sports. And, uh, but there's some really bad ones and there, and it's, we need to be aware of both because we need to be supporting, we need to supporting, be supporting legislatures, uh, and, and individual legislators that are trying to advance good legislation. And we also need to recognize when there's bad stuff out there and why it's out there and, why it's bad and what that means in the long term. Where even if you look at it on the face and, of it and you say, "Well, individually, this bill, you know, I don't have a stake in this bill." Right? There are going to be some we talk about here where I guarantee you, a lot of you won't have an individual stake in this type of bill. But it's what does it mean over the longer term if a bill like like some of these we're going to talk about and and don't, and don't worry for those of you who tuned in because you wanted to hear about the new waters of the U.S. rule. We are going to talk about that, but it's so complex that literally we needed more time to do our homework. Yeah. So we actually, we have a list of things, yeah. but and, right? the other thing I was going to say is oh, in sorry. addition to that, um, if you tuned into our last podcast, now you're going to understand when we talk about these state bills, yeah, right. just how fast they can move from a concept into law and why you have to weigh in right off the bat. Yeah. And in today's point, it, they go through fast in a state house or state legislature and the one thing we didn't cover is just the fact that ideas from one state kind of get yep. migrated to others and, yes. and they share legislators, yeah. meet with legislators from other states. They get together yeah, to for everybody who does joint bills yeah. and things. Well, for everybody that doesn't know, I go like every year we go to, I go to conferences where we're talking to uh, legislators from every state. They all meet at these conferences and then they pass these bills around to each other. Kind of like, it's like trick or treating. They're going around. They're like, you got a bill for me. You got a bill for me. And they're passing around these ideas. So you can have a bill start in one state and it's just like uh, either in a good way, like great ideas grow or in a bad way, like a virus, <laughs> they get passed well, and around. And it's not just the legislators, right? Uh, because there are groups you know, there are organizations out there that do the same thing. So they they meet and they come up with draft legislation, uh, and they come you know, some sort of uh, what do you call it? The template. Of yep. The, and then they pass that template they pass from legislator that, to legislator. Yeah. So they're they're trying to advance organizational policy. Right. Think tanks around certain concepts. Right. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes those come with some of those groups. Also, you know, they they lobby, and some of those groups fund campaigns too. Right. And some are good. 
and, yeah. and some are, and we'll give you, I mean, we've talked about the constitutional right to hunt and fish. Yes. That for those that don't know, the NRA is one of the big drivers, the National Rifle Association. They right? started that. They started that uh, model legislation for what these constitutional rights to hunt and fish could look like around the country. And, and these states have, have taken off and run with it, and they've ad- adapted it for their own state politics. Like in Utah, where House Joint Resolution 15 is – Gonna is getting some steam, and people are saying they, like it, it. Their potential is really there, where that could become part of the Utah Constitution. A constitutional amendment has to be done, but in order for that to occur, first two thirds of each house in Utah now are going to be discussing this potential change, this legislation, and then that will allow it to go in front of the voters. And so that's one of these bills we're talking about, HJR fifteen in Utah. Thank you very much. We may get a constitutional right, which amendment would, which would make it, I think, the twenty third state to have a constitutional amendment uh, recognizing the right to hunt and fish, um, and that started with the NRA and some other groups working with the NRA, and and then you know feeding that to legislators in various states, and then maybe mm-hmm. those legislators then met with other other legislators at these conferences that that yeah, Nephi is talking yeah. about, and it's it's all very. Uh, interconnected. And yeah, right. Despite, you know, it is a union, right? We're a union of states. And despite the the, the differences between the, the state of Maryland and the state of Wyoming, we do have members that do to get together um, from each one of those states just to kind of talk policy and issues. So, you know, it, there is some continuity. Sort of some of these bills. <laughs> we talked about, like, I already hit one, which is the constitutional right to hunt and fish. Yeah, well, let's... And harvest wildlife in Utah. So, um, so I view that as you just started with a good one. I did. Right? So do you want me to hit, and we've talked about it, let me hit a couple of the bad ones. Let's uh, do good ones first and then just do all bad ones. Well, I thought we could go alternate or, you know. Okay. I, I mean, I don't, I don't I really, I guess I really don't Mike, care. We're arguing about it, so we'll let Mike decide. Do we, every other or do we? I think there's going to be people listening to this that disagree with us, so nope. it's not going to matter. No, there aren't. Some are going to be good, some are going to be bad, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah. And, so and it doesn't matter. That's true. So let me just. Let me lump them into a category. So I'll just do a category of bills okay. here. And we've talked about this category of bills before because this is something that has come up repeatedly year after year in state houses around the country. And it's it's about uh, – well, let me let me put it this way. You know what it's about, right? I'm, look at me here. I'm drinking a you're soda out of – You're yourself in the side of the head. I'm drinking – Oh, no. You're pointing I'm at drinking a, a soda out of a, a koozie from a turkey invitational that I – uh, participated in yeah. and wearing a baseball cap from a two shot goose hunt. It's about the that evil of in. competitions to harvest wildlife. Right. Yeah, that's uh, what we're in. That's that's the series of bills I wanted to talk about, and I'm very intentionally wearing this hat and drinking yep. out of this koozie right now. And I'm joking when I say <laughs> the evils because that's what the other side, like that's what the the sure. argument is about. Is one side is saying like, oh my gosh, you can't have competi- you can't have contests. Related to wildlife. Right. So what a lot of these bills in the past, what they started with, and, and you'll see a couple of them doing the same thing here, were an attempt to stop predator hunting contests and specifically coyotes. Right. They're, so they're – because coyote contests are – they've been around since the dawn of time, right? I, I, I challenge you to find a, a, t- <laughs> a time when there was not a coyote contest. As long as people were trying to kill coyotes. Somebody there's was making a, a bet. There, there's been a contest to see how <laughs> who efficiently who can do it the best. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and so we have a couple of states right now. Um, and Oregon is one, uh, HB 4075, House Bill 4075, that would prohibit coyote contests specifically. Uh, there have been a couple of states that have gone this very specific route. But what's been happening more, you're seeing it expand beyond predator contests or coyote contests Mm -hmm. and to include contests of any kind. So you have one in uh, New Hampshire, uh, Senate Bill 588, also this year, which would ban coyote hunting contests and any other contest involving wildlife. Uh, That's... um, hmm? Any other contest? I mean, any other contest involving the take of wildlife? Right. Okay. Right. Uh, I mean, dog. instead of dog shows, dog, yeah, right. <laughs> that's what you're thinking. Well, of. yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's th- those are a couple of state examples right now in New Hampshire 
and in Oregon that would ban contests. Uh, so, so some are specific to just predators and some are in general. Right. And, and some so are what's, looking what's at what's the real, general. what's the real difference on the opposition? I mean, okay. What predators we got? I think there's the, so here's what I think that uh, like with predators, people want to see coyote competitions banned because they, they think people are killing these coyotes and they're not eating them. Mm hmm. Uh, they, they think the method of take is often in the eyes of those criticizing it very inhumane. Okay. Uh, what's the difference? I mean, what do they, what do they use dynamite? I mean, what's the difference in some places? It, it, it's really not very regulated. It's any method of take that you okay. want to use, uh, for, for certain predators and particularly for coyotes. Yeah. Uh, some places are more regulated than others. Uh, but it, it you know, I, I think it's. You, you have these contests, and at the end of a day, there could be 150 or 200 dead coyotes, and they stack them up, and they take pictures of them. And, mm, mm-hmm. and I could see where that would offend somebody. And it, and it mm-hmm. offends a lot of people, right? Mm-hmm. It does. It, the, there, there are folks that don't like it. Uh, it, it, raises, it. It can raise a bunch of money, um, okay. but there are folks that don't like it. Then you, and I'm not here to judge those contests sure. because yeah. one thing biologically we know about coyotes is when it you have doesn't matter is it doesn't if you kill a coyote they'll just make two yeah <laughs> right yeah. like they they actually coyotes are one of those species that respond to uh pop, yeah. to pressure by having more litters let's just say that there's there's pups. two sides to this argument though because for you to say that like and i think it, people then think like oh well then we should just Stop all hunting of coyotes, and then they won't be a problem. Well, that's not the case either. Well, that's so. That's what I just. That's what I was yeah. getting at. Oh, you, okay. That's what I was saying is the biologically when you when you do that when you when you poison or shoot or you do these things to coyotes when you're killing a lot of coyotes they actually reproduce faster and with and more. I mean, so more often and yeah. with larger litters. Yeah, uh, but and, what but I'm ne- saying is like Nephi's point I'm saying is the opposite that, of that. Yeah, I see. Oh, like, the, the studies are out there, and I and I get this, but the reality is, for people that somebody would think, oh, well, then we should just quit shooting coyotes, and suddenly they won't be a problem. That's not true either. Oh no, that's not. No, in fact, right. if you don't control them, you really do have issues. And and with mule deer herds, you have issues with livestock because this idea that you know, it's it's just it isn't as simple as that. Well, and mm-hmm. if if you don't if you don't remove if you don't use contests to remove them, it's going to be places like. USDA's animal services. That's animal gonna, Plant Health Inspection Service, Wildlife right. Services. The wildlife Avis. Services. Yeah. Avis. Yes. And they'll come in and... Second best agency in the history of the federal government. They'll, they'll re- <laughs> You're required to say that by marriage, aren't you? I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point is, if you don't... If the contests don't take them, something else will. Right, um, yeah. For... for so- so then, but, so, so okay, but there are that, concerns, predator right? Ones, there are right? concerns with predators, yeah. But then there's some that were the take, um, either it's a, like you mentioned, you've got turkey hunt, you've got goose hunt, things like that. And, you know, I assume contestants are going to eat the meat or someone will. Um, absolutely. So I can, I can definitively speak to a couple of the types of, of the contests that I participate in. Mm-hmm. I participated in, in a goose hunt. Um, we have them in this state for just about every species. You know, antelope, we have them. Uh, but specifically for this goose hunt, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I'll talk about it again because I think it just does some really great things. You enter with a partner into this comp- into this contest, and mm-hmm. you're given, you're allowed two shells, it's hence the two-shot goose hunt. Right. In this area, the limit for a day is four per person. So you're, it's during the regular hunting season. You're hunting within the limit. You have two shells. Um if you wound an animal and you have to use another shell, it just means that animal doesn't count in the contest. Right? You get two, two shells, uh, but you also you're not going to leave a wounded animal. You're going to you're going to finish it and you're going to take it right. Mm-hmm. You so you use your two shots. You kill a couple of geese. You take them in. You have them weighed, uh, and the contest is the number of birds and total weight is the tiebreaker. So if you have multiple teams that bring in four geese, then you go to total weight. There's a contest for the biggest bird. There's a contest for the smallest bird. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but the point is, and you, you might win, might win firearms, you, you know, by, by winning that contest. But the point is it raises for this small community where this occurs of 3,000, 3,500 people, right? It raises 
tens of thousands of dollars that go back into wetland conservation so that that these areas are conserved for waterfowl stopover on their migration routes. Um, and it's been an unbelievable asset for waterfowl conservation. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't get this money in a town that size, but for a competition like this. Yeah. Same thing can be said about the turkey hunt that I per- participate in. That generates tens of thousands of dollars a year for a community of 400 people. Without that money coming into that community, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to do some of the projects that they're able to yeah. do. Yeah. Right? So I, I assume that expands into some of the fishing, um, you know, two fly, one fly. Yeah. Fishing you know, competitions yeah. too. Or even, yeah. Coastal stuff. Yeah. Fairly enough. It also, it also goes into predator hunting. All right. So, so we covered the, the idea of, um, c- you know, competitive hunting in relation to, um, predators and other species for which, okay, probably going to consume them. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the fact that that applies, um, equally to then generate revenue for creating habitat and other good things on right. the ground. So what are some other bills? Yeah. Well, let's wrap a, a bow around this discussion really quick. Let and me say something. Yeah, go ahead. And then you can wrap the bow sure. around after I say this. I think that the, part of the problem is this. You, you got to be really careful when you're dealing with these issues, when you're dealing with management, because when you look at those numbers, example, for predator hunting and coyotes and this idea that, uh, well, if you get rid of a coyote, then two come in its place. That only applies if you're looking at a small area and you're only looking at one year's worth of control. The science says that when you expand the area of control and then when you have a a management paradigm that works year after year, things change and it changes the entire dynamic. When you're looking at this idea that we are going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to ban contests or whatever, please remember that you're, you're making an ethics judgment on something that we should really step back from that because the reality is the wildlife management agencies, the reason that these things are, you know, they endorse these things because they understand that we're looking at the long term. We're looking at the, at, at, at the long term herd uh, dynamics within an ecosystem of different players there. And they take these things into account. And so when we anthropomorphize animals and then start to add these extra layers of reasoning onto whether something's right or wrong, it gets real messy real quick. Yeah, and the other thing that I'd add to kind of wrap up this part of the discussion is you have wildlife agencies, kind of building off of what you said, wildlife agencies are depending on revenue coming in from hunters and anglers to help pay for wildlife management. They can only sell so many licenses. Hunters and, hunters and anglers do so much more to try and generate that revenue. What these contests do is they help generate the revenue that the agency can't get otherwise to help do on-the-ground projects. And if you want to see in some of these local communities, if you want to see good, you you want good pheasant hunting, you want good waterfowl hunting, you want to see, you want to see that water used to to create more wetlands or, or conserve the wetlands. You want to see people get behind that. What about the other thing? You know, some of these groups have these contests, raise this money, and then they donate chunks of it back to the department for access programs. Yeah. Like I know in, in Wyoming, the one of the chapters of Pheasants Forever here, and I know this is the case in a lot of places with Pheasants Forever, they'll raise this money whether it's through banquets or through contests. They'll raise this money, and a portion of that money they'll give back to the agency and donate it to, the, to their various access programs, the, the private land access programs, to open up places for hunting opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and so when, you, when you're having an, a direct attack on through these bills – on uh, on contests, blanket, on all contests, you take a blanket approach, mm-hmm. you have to look at the consequences of that action. And what does that mean for the tens of thousands in some cases to the hundreds of thousands in other cases of revenue that comes in in a given year from these contests that goes right back into creating opportunity and improving habitat and, and you know, improving numbers these these contests are they're a positive thing they absolutely they're a positive can be. thing for and and i hate to say this for anybody that is like looking down their nose at the kind of contest they don't like in term instead they they like a different kind whether it's a fishing derby or something else we need to take step off the step off the podium step off your high horse and and realize these things are positive carte blanche like when you're going around and seeing where these things are are being done 
they're doing positive things in those communities, whether or not you necessarily agree with them based on your personal ethic. Now let's let's do carve out for every rule. There's an exception. Sure. There could very well be bad examples, bad actors in the contest, organizing contests and having having contests. There could very well be some bad actors. We're, it's a big country with a lot of contests all over the place. And if there's a bad actor, that individual bad actor and that bad contest that does things the wrong way and uses the money in the wrong way, figure out a way to stop it. But you don't need to do that through a legislative approach that that bans all contests. You, you don't punish everybody for the actions of a few. Right. Would be my my take on it. Okay. Right? I agree. Really? Mm-hmm. Nephi and Dave agree? Hmm. Well, we just wanted to get to the next subject. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just impressed. We sometimes we don't we don't agree on things. <laughs> he accommodates moving the subject along. I guess. <laughs> All right. Um Nephi, what you want to take the next topic? Um I want to talk about regulations and changing them. So I want to talk about uh, Iowa House file seven sixteen. So in a number of places in the Midwest, um, there is a unique prohibitions against hunting in certain seasons based on different types of guns. So for example, in Iowa, it's really tough to get to hunt with a, you know, if you have a quote unquote, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it a traditional long rifle or whatever, but there are a lot of different seasons and then the opportunities to hunt in those seasons are pretty restricted based on what you want to take deer with. So for example, um, they have a list of approved cartridges that you can take deer with outside of the rifle season. And the rifle season is like in the, like if you're going to hunt with a 30 out six in Iowa, so these, you know, common, what we'd consider hunting rifles in Iowa, you're going to wait your, like your turn comes last. Like after everything else has been gone through your muzzle loader and handgun and, and archery and everything else. Now the exception is they have the, what they call the straight walled cartridge rule where they have a bunch of calibers that you can hunt with a, you know, it could be a rifle that you're hunting with if you're using one of these straight walled calibers. And these are traditionally, these were pistol calibers. So things like uh, 44 Magnum, 357 Magnum. Um, and then now it's things like, uh, you know, the 454 Casul, um, and, and But it also includes the 4570 cartridge, which we'd all agree you're probably not hunting with a 4570 revolver. You know, it's those. So those are the the 450 um, or the 40 Smith and Wesson. The 40 Smith and Wesson is very small. Yeah. But yeah, this is. But like the 450 uh, 450 Bushmaster. So some of these cartridges are now we're looking at kind of rifle straight. You, so you can use these straight wall cartridges in a rifle as well, and they've recognized that. So um, this year they're looking at adding some new calibers to that, and. Um, one of the calibers that they haven't added, and I'm just throwing this out there, so is called 300 Blackout. So 300 Blackout is not a, a true straight weld cartridge, but it is unique because it's a cartridge that um, is a little bit less powerful than a 3030. It runs energy wise about the same as a 44 Mag or a 454 Casul. But what makes it neat is this is a cartridge that's very popular today because it can be used in the modern sporting rifle platform. So you have America's most popular rifle, about 18 million modern sporting rifles, people call them, or ARs, if you want to call them that. Well, this 300 Blackout cartridge is a cartridge that's just about perfect for deer in terms of its energy. Um, and uh, it's just one of those examples where if you were looking at kind of the intent of the original law in Iowa, which was to that people use these lower power cartridges... Now you have a modern cartridge, the 300 Blackout, which actually fits that intent very well. It just doesn't happen to be a true, quote-unquote, straight-walled cartridge. If it were, and so if they changed this in, in as they're looking at this bill, if they added 300 Blackout and made that legal, it would open up – it would it would open up a considerably large opportunity for bringing new hunters in and not having to have them go out and buy a brand-new rifle a brand new you know way to go you know so they could modify their existing sporting rifle to so you're talking yeah you know, yeah a hundred bucks people that are out that love sport shooting but they haven't they haven't hunted uh yet there's an opportunity to recruit them into hunting you bet and, and so they now, wouldn't have to go buy a new yeah, fire that's right so today it, yeah so 13 percent so cost of, to entry would be yeah, about 15 percent of the guns being sold today in america 
our traditional hunting rifles. So bolt actions, lever actions, pump actions. About 20% of the guns being sold in America today are modern sporting rifles. So you have more of this class being sold than you do of the other class. And so if we're looking at recruiting people in, this is an opportunity with a very simple change. Now you, you create a doorway to those people who are, that's their world, to be able to bring them in to hunting the most popular big game species to hunt in America, which is white-tailed deer, with a cartridge that's just about perfect for it. And the only thing that's stopping us is tradition. So what's the likelihood you, see, you think of this bill going anywhere? I don't, even, I don't know. Don't know? Well, no, so it's, it's, low, it's low, but it's, it's worth... But it takes time. The one yeah, thing you've got to remember... it's introducing the concept. It, it's amazing in state legislatures how you can have some bills that might be introduced one time, and 20 days later... They're on the governor's desk and signed. Yeah, right. It's the first time you've ever seen it. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then you can have others where where it might take several years of reintroducing the same concept uh, because you're talking – you're butting up against – well, we've talked about this before – butting up against the the decades of tradition. Think Sunday hunting bills, the blue laws, yes. right? Mm-hmm. They, it takes a long, long time to overcome that. Maybe this falls into that category. So Iowa House File 716 – um, the the other you know, the thing I would say is if you're in a state, take a look and see if it's legal to hunt white-tailed deer with a cartridge 300 blackout. Because the so, other thing is, it's perfect. It's a it's a pistol cartridge. It was it works best in a 10 inch barreled gun, and so when you get longer or shorter than that, you lose performance. And so it it really is an ideal white-tail woods type type firearm. It's just a neat cartridge that again the tradition of of kind of how we think about what what we hunt with and what we don't and what's it okay and what's not and is it a shotgun or not well there are some states like Minnesota that have already realized this and a lot of people are hunting now with 300 blackout pistols and it's it's just a perfect it's really good for white tailed deer and so if it's not legal in your state i encourage you to take a look at it do you, and do ask you know why. Uh, i'm not expecting you to know this i'm just wondering is it common for states to regulate based upon the name of the cartridge uh, as opposed to just the metrics of, of the performance. Uh, it depends. I think okay. out West, I think we've kind of haven't done that. Haven't done which one? We haven't do, like out West. I think you have more of the energy, you know, it'd be okay. energy and speed being kind of the main thing. Right. So, in, so, in so if you West. can find whatever yeah, they cartridge don't say you it's can okay. find. Ot 6 is okay. 300, you know, Wind Mag is not, you know, the, that's not, that, but if you get in some of these older states, mm-hmm. What happened in some of these older areas is when people started making these laws, the Game and Fish Commission were the guys that like they kind of put this benchmark in where they literally just looked at there, – there wasn't the wide variety that we have today. Right, yeah. And so what they did is they, they literally named certain cartridges – that were okay because that's what was available. So, well, so this is going to require in Iowa. It requires a, a legislative bill, yes, to make it through and get signed yep. by the governor in order to get a different cartridge approved. Right, right now, as the, opposed to just yeah and regulation. Yeah, some or, states do it through regulation, right? right and and that's states. it's kind of both in Iowa. Is so it, in okay. Iowa, what it does is it there's a there the legislation specifies point three five as being the minimum diameter. And we've seen this in Wyoming too, in other places. Right. And then, but then it's a, it's a, it's a minimum cartridge diameter, but then also it's a, it's straight walled. But then what they've done is then game and fish goes through and they stay through the commission. They, they then go, okay. And then they name off all the cartridges that they've decided fit the bill. Okay. So they've interpreted the legislation and yes. they've created a regulatory structure. But here's the issue with a cartridge them. like okay. this. This is the question mark, whether this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And I put it out for you guys to think about and weigh in. A 300 blackout, when you look at the performance of the cartridge, falls right in line with everything else on this list. It is considerably better than a 357 Magnum in terms of energy and performance. And it's nowhere near as good as you know a 500 B Wolf or a or a or a you know 4570. It's running right in the middle with things again like a 44 Magnum that that every uh, that everybody's like oh yeah this is perfect you can use this cartridge. The question is, should you be disallowing cartridges by because they don't you know what's the reason for having that rule? And if that rule is a limiting factor, and in this case. I would submit that all across this country, we have rules like this, where it was never the intent, where we are fencing people out 
of participating in hunting with tools that they already have because of tradition. The tradition is like, oh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a 44 Magnum. It's this other cartridge that we, that while it's absolutely equal to it in performance and everything else, we didn't okay that one because traditionally that's not what we hunt with. So the question is, should we be doing that? I would submit no. I would submit that it's time to take a, a nice long look everywhere and say, what's the real reason that we, these restrictions came into place? Why do we have those rules? And should we break down those restrictions if it's going to get people into the sport? Because quite frankly, there's more access to that tool and the tool is perfectly suited for hunting white-tailed deer. So anyway, that's it. All right. All right. Well, I want to stay in the Midwest with this next one. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna move to Iowa's neighbor to the west in Nebraska. Oh, you, you lost me. Oh, Nebraska. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, the state where you can sit on the back porch and watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Nebraska. Yeah, I do too. Um, I'm... I'm liking them a little less when I see this bill Uh that's floating out there in Nebraska right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Nebraska is a unicameral legislature. Right. Which means they don't have a Senate and a House. These bills move even faster in Nebraska. (laughs) They they have one body. One body that does all of it. The legislature. So when we're talking about in other states, Senate bill or Senate file or House bill or House file or resolution or... That's not the case in Nebraska. In Nebraska, it's just legislative bill 126. Okay. Right. So LB 126 in Nebraska. Trying to think about the best way to say this, but I'll just lay it out there and we'll have a discussion about it. So here's what the bill does. The bill creates a special deer season, white-tailed deer season for landowners. Mm Mm-hmm. What do I mean by that? Well, in addition to a season, it also creates licenses. It's not uncommon in states to have landowner licenses. That's not an uncommon thing. Mm-hmm. Where if you own a piece right. of property, you know, it's it's recognized that you are, by being a large landowner, you are creating and conserving habitat for these species that are in the public interest. And if you want to be able to hunt on your own land, you should be able to hunt on your own land. And so it's not uncommon for states to have landowner licenses uh, that effectively say, one, thank you for managing this land, and two, we think you should be entitled to hunt on your own property because those animals are probably causing some crop damage or or other damage, and you should be entitled to hunt your own land. Mm -hmm. So that's not uncommon. This bill provides some of that. It provides... Uh, four additional uh, landowner licenses for immediate family for $5 each. So you can get four white-tailed deer tags. The other thing it does is, and this is where, this is piece I have a little bit of a problem with, and it's, it opens up a season for landowners that starts three days before the season for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So one, you get a bunch of buck tags and then you get to hunt those bucks three days before anybody and, else. And the person that fills out that tag has to be a family member of the owner? Has to be an immediate family member of the owner. And, and, what, and what's it's, the owner? It's for hunting for, on your own property. I don't know. I haven't looked into Nebraska law to see if the owner can be a corporation. Yeah. Or if it has to be, if it's a for small farm, you know, yeah. family you, farm. Yeah, you went right where I was thinking, too. Yeah. So. so I haven't gone there. Okay. And, so I don't know the answer and, to that question. And then question. do you have to be a majority owner at that point? I mean, like if you and I... We're to go in together, halvesies, right, or thirdsies, with include Nephi. How do we do that? Do we each get four, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I don't know the answer. Okay, to right. any those but questions. That's a lot of. But those, those are, are good of... questions to ask, right? Yeah. Right, if you're in Nebraska and looking into this bill, and the, so I guess I pose this question to to folks listening, and we can have a little discussion about it here too, uh, of you know under our system of wildlife management, does it make sense to open up a landowner only? hunting season that precedes the hunting season for the, the general public. Um, and not only that, here, here's the, is this even, the bill that required that they, in, in order to access those tags, they had to provide public access. No. 
Oh, okay. So that's the other thing. Um, my understanding of this bill is there's not an access requirement tied to it. Um, the, the licenses are only good for their own land. So they get the landowner licenses. They can't use them anywhere else. They can only use them on their own land. Okay. But it was under the guise of, you know, one, thanking landowners for, for raising deer, basically. Right, yeah. Um, and two, uh, because there's crop loss, you know, it was a... Yeah, they wanted. This is a way to. Uh, to the idea was yeah. to offset crop loss and allow for some population control. Hmm. Y- yet, some of the pushback, some of the arguments against that have been: well, if that's really the case, if really what you want to do with this is to reduce deer numbers, to reduce crop damage, then shouldn't those tags be for does and not buck tags? Right. Um, since hmm. the place where you reduce numbers from population year to year standpoint is through doe harvest. Um, well, I'm not a Nebraska landowner, so I don't like it. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, it does, it does have hints of it to being sort of the landed gentry get to hunt. Right. Right. It, it, hints that was, it. that was kind of my first takeaway is it almost felt like we're moving in the direction of private ownership of wildlife. Right. Or yeah. Yes and yes and no, but yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean that, that that's that's sort of the. I'm willing to bet that's some of the thought process behind it. It's like, well, those things are on my land; they're my darn deer. Um, so let me ask you that: Is it just deer? It's just deer. Just deer. Okay, and four, four so, additional. So it really incentivizes having a larger piece of land. Um, and if, you, if that's what you're going for, right? Rather than buying a postage stamp. And, yeah, I don't know. I, what, I want my forte. I haven't looked into seeing what the acreage, if there are acreage limitations on the bill or yeah. anything like that. What it takes to get the license. Huh. Um, it, I, I guess from where I sit, I look at it as uh, well. There are a couple other things that come into play. There's not a lot of public land in Nebraska. Right? There's very little public land. So, right, yeah. so if the public is looking to to hunt, they're likely having to either uh, get. Well, they're likely having to get permission from a landowner. Uh, now, that permission can come in a lot of forms. It could just be a handshake agreement saying, yep, you can come out and hunt. Uh, it could be they're leasing the place to hunt on that. And if I'm spending, and I'll use that example, if I'm spending, I don't know how much a lease goes for, but I imagine it can be pretty expensive um, depending on where you are. Mm-hmm. If you're spending a lot of money on a deer lease in Nebraska and you find out that that, that, that landowner now can buy four buck tags and uh yeah, and but, start that season three days before you come out but will the landowner take the best wouldn't the landowner have an incentive to keep those out there for to make their property look more attractive to the purchaser perhaps yeah i mean perhaps i don't know that I, might don't, be right. I, I don't know maybe I'd it want, might regulate I'd, itself yeah it's kind of what you're saying good uh that um but then again, maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm. I don't know. Maybe I want to get it before my neighbor gets it. Yeah, there, I mean, yeah, there's just a, if, yeah. And I've never had any problems with landowner licenses, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think some states uh, do do a better job than others. But I, I uh, the fundamental concept I don't I've never had an issue with this idea that if you have a big piece of property and you're creating habitat and deer are using that property. And they're eating forage and you know, maybe crops and other things on that property. That's mm-hmm. costing the landowner some money, right? Uh, to be able to provide that habitat. Well, it, and and we've also taken out of the hands of the landowner the ability to self control that, right? We, we've said, I understand there's something that's coming on your land that's harming you economically, but you're not allowed to do anything about it because we, as a state, regulate the tax. Right. And so as part of that compromise, I totally get the idea of the state coming in and saying, all right, we, we understand that we've taken away from you what normally would be a property right, and that's to control whatever comes onto your land and shoot predators, shoot anything, in your crops. Uh, and as part of that compromise, giving them uh, a couple extra tags, that seems fair to me. Um, it's just sort of part of the compromise, right? Right. And that's, like I said, that's fairly common. Mm-hmm. That's kind of commonplace. Um around the country to have these landowner tags to be able to use them for, you know, that exact purpose. Right. It it's, just doesn't, it, you don't it, think about it very much because that's, um, that is a, one of the bundles of the stick that was taken away so long ago. We forget right. that 
the idea of pro private property is complete and total um, domain over whatever's there. Right. Right. And we've taken that away through this this licensing program. So, but the so the piece that I am more concerned about is having a hunting season that starts before early. So before you just don't like to get videos. access early. Now, now. Oh, I'm just. I'm looking at. I mean, this they bill can right they now. can still control access. So that if this say the season starts on October 15th mm -hmm. normally, and now they can come out on the 12th and start. Well, they don't have to let anybody hunt on their place, and so that maybe they, maybe it doesn't have that much of an impact, right? Um, or maybe it impacts neighbors that. Have Having reasons. hunted with Dave, I just know that he's he's always going to be the guy that's got to have ha uh, half a step ahead of you on the trail because <laughs> he wants to be there first, and if somebody's going to get it what? four days early. <laughs> okay, so uh, an important aspect of this is that I, I want to read it to you. So, okay. looking at the bill now, right now, in addition to any. Limited permit to hunt deer issued to a qualifying landowner under this subsection of this section. The commission shall issue up to four free firearm deer hunting permits to hunt deer during the seven days immediately preceding the beginning date for the firearm deer hunting season of any landowner and designated members of his or her family. If, this is important, okay. such landowner consents to make 50% or more of his or her farm or ranch located in any single commission designated deer management unit available for public deer hunting hmm. during the firearm deer hunting season. Is that by any holder of a valid firearm deer hunting permit? So that's the bill. Anybody, this is what makes the bill anybody. very unique. Is that this that's, that's this, this session? It. That's this is this I'm bill. Looking. This is the bill. I just pulled it up. So this is the bill. So, so there what are that mixed doing, report on, reports on this. So you're trading and this is what makes it unique. You are trading. This is the bill. I'm looking at it. Okay. I, mean, I just pulled it up off of my secret um, my I secret saw. system that, that yeah, yeah. nobody you're, else you're has right. except that is me. The bill. I, so I will say I'm glad you did that because I was reporting something that wasn't in it and I was taking it from a media report and the media report was wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, that's, but this is what makes it also very unique when you look at it. So wow. would you trade if you're the general public in a state that's primarily private land, would you trade some deer for access? Cause that's what this is doing. That yeah. is what this opening is doing. up half your property. Well, I think the, the bigger takeaway for me maybe everybody listening is that um, don't rely on the news. Always go to the source and Nephi has got this special little thing, but that's not, a, that's not really that special. All you got to do is go onto the legislative website for the, yeah, I wish I, I normally, body and then I normally do that. I wish yeah. I, and now I'm regretting having done that. I yeah, literally you, pulled you, up a, what I viewed as a, it would be a secondary source, but mm -hmm. it was a reputable state newspaper right. uh, of wide distribution that was laying out the, you know, the bill. I had to write but comments on this bill when it first came out for my, you? for my organization. That's why I thought like when you said, it, I was like, I, I, I remember something different about this bill. Yeah. What is it? And so I just pulled it up. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, it does, I mean, you also have to remember though, that, um, most, if, if hunting is only 5% of the population, right? Hunters yeah. are 5% of the population. That means that, um, probably only 5% of reporters are going to be hunters. And so they may not understand the, the intricacies of these things. And well, you have to go to the actual source information. I, Look at it yourself. Figure out what it means because you can't necessarily believe everything you read in the newspaper. It's crazy, though, when you think about like the, that kind of trade. If you were a wildlife official in that state, is it worth the trade? You know, so, and I guess the question is like, how many of the people who are hunting deer are the currently are the landowners? So you're not getting that money anymore for their tags. And how many of the people are urban folks who would like to get out and hunt if they could, but just don't have access? Yeah. And so is it worth it for the future of hunting and fishing to trade? Well, I mean, so, to, so instead of an access program where I would be paying Mike, right? If yeah. I'm game and fish, I'd be paying you, Mike. I'm like, hey, here's some, here's some, here's a check. Right. We're going to write from Game and Fish from our Pittman Robertson money. Here's a check we're going to write to you so that you'll let people come access. Instead, it's four Instead, chances. Instead, it's like, here's a tag. Listen to this really quick. Yeah. I just got to throw this out there because you, know, you went right to the primary source, the bill itself. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't do that on this one. I've done that on these other right, ones. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to read you what the newspaper article said. All right. So we, maybe this is a good said. lesson. Yeah. This is a great teaching opportunity. Um this is, this is verbatim. This comes from 
uh, the, the newspaper in Nebraska, when it's talking about this deer hunt, it says landowners would be allowed to hunt on their own property during a three day weekend prior to the start of the regular rifle deer season under an amended bill given second round approval by a 25 to six vote Thursday. Um, and it also said a landowner could t- obtain up to four permits for immediate family members for $5 each. So you had said the bill says they were free. This says $5. This also has a... a but that talks about an amended, amendment. You got the latest version, Nephi? Uh, yeah, did you read the amended version? See. Ooh, this could be a new... We're going to... Real-time lesson here. I I'm, wanna... I'm reading a version. I'm reading the. Let's see. Let me. You guys keep yeah. keep talking. Yeah, yeah. I'll keep talking. <laughs> keep talking. So keep we might going. be. Keep yeah. Going. So we might be onto something here. We'll we'll. Uh, so that's the introduced version. Okay. Tell you back. While he's doing that, let's talk about another bill that we can just run, a couple that we can run through. Really sure. Quick. Sure. No. No and, deep and dive on these. I, while you're looking at it, just double check if that alters other landowner tags that they would have been entitled to. It. Um, in, in other words, if you could it's get a landowner tag, it's going to get real tag. complex because it because it does. There's a landowner tag provision that's up above it. This is in addition to. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, I thought it was so additional. It's an additional. Tags. Yeah, it was additional. Well, now I now I understand why it's a good idea to let them out early, because if you let them out early, then you know they're enrolled, and then uh, you you've confirmed that they've got it, and then you can disseminate information on whose land is available. Go, you know, this particular farm. So you can kind of work out a system. Whereby well, the public you, might know. Couldn't you do that anyway? It was, you guys, it depends you on you when you have issue to, the tag. You wouldn't yeah. have to have the early hunting season. You just have a deadline for which to enroll in this program yeah. to, to have four additional deer tags on your own place. Well, and then if you were the landowner, couldn't you just say, okay, well, I'm just not going to let the public hunt on my place until we're four days into the rifle season, the normal rifle season. I'm going to limit access that way rather than starting the season early. You could. You but, could accomplish but, something similar. But an opening day is an important day. It is an important day. Um, seven days early is apparently an important day, <laughs> important day too. All right. All right um, so while bill. Nephi's looking at that, let me just run through a couple of other bills here. We won't go into a deep dive, but circling back a little bit to this, the regulating contest bill, the other thing where there's a lot of momentum around the country from some of the more animal rights groups, okay. because those are the ones that are behind these contest bans. Mm-hmm. They're also pushing from sea to shining sea, trapping bans. Okay. Uh, and, and that's another one. Uh, so there's a bill in New Hampshire right now. And I mentioned there's a contest bill in New Hampshire too. Oh yeah. There's yeah. also a bill and the bill would create, would require a study. Yeah. So it, it would be to study the effects of a ban on recreational trapping. So this is HB 1504. Uh, and they have to report back later this year on the results of that study. Um, Code word, you know, study is usually the first step to the official ban. Yeah, um, because it's easier to pass a study than it than it is to pass. Right. We we have actual data to support whatever your objective is. Exactly. Yeah, and only for recreational trapping. That's what it calls. Um, hmm. So I think the idea then, but recreational would include, you know, if you or I wanted to go set a trap line. Um, for, mm-hmm. for beaver or something like that, right? That or muskrat or whatever, um, that would in, be included here. Right. But if if there were damage caused and you need to do some trapping to address dra- damage issues, that wouldn't be viewed as recreational trapping. Right. So it's a fairly narrow trapping ban, but it's still a proposal on trapping. Mm-hmm. I think there's one other state that was looking at doing. I just brought it up because it it seemed like like we recognize there's a problem here. We just want to. Make sure we're going to prevent our friends from having, you know, their version of in- enjoyment or whatever the value they get out of the activity. Yeah, yeah. You're picking on people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's a couple others uh, in the state of Washington. So this this builds off of a conversation we had a couple episodes ago where we were talking about ballot initiatives. Mm-hmm. Well, in the state of Washington, back in 1996, this is one of the states where wildlife management was done through ballot initiative. Uh, and in that case, it, there was a ballot initiative to end, to prohibit the use of dogs for hunting mountain lions. Mm-hmm. Well, now fast forward, well, almost well, 24 years, you've got a bill floating around that would actually allow hunting with dogs 
in certain parts of the state. It turns out lions are really, really hard to hunt. <laughs> and dogs make a big difference to be able to hunt them. Yeah. And, and there are parts of the state of Washington where the lion populations are really... Uh, Munching on runners? You got it. Not necessarily human runners, but... Okay. It, 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 the the lion population exploded to the point where you're having some conflict issues with livestock and other things. Yeah. Um, and there's been an attempt to regulate them through hunting uh, or to address it through hunting, but without being able to hunt with dogs, it is really hard to hunt lions. You know, to, so dogs chasing, chasing cats. I mean, what, what it, it's yeah. not, you know, tail as old as time. Right? <laughs> uh, I don't know where that one's going to go. I just know that that one's been introduced, but as we know, uh, from what we talked about in our the ballot initiative episode, once a ballot initiative passes, it is exceedingly difficult to sure. overturn. It's those almost like a compact with the people, yeah, right. And where the the people as a a body have said this is the direction we want to go, so gets, rather yeah. than a smaller group subset deciding how to do things. So it gets really hard to change it. Sure. A uh, couple others here. Um, one here's a here's a kind of a feel good one. Uh, I like this one a little bit. Uh, in West Virginia, House Bill forty five twenty three, it would it would create unlimited apprentice hunting and trapping license opportunities. So let me put it this way: right now, in it, it varies from state to state. It can be one to three times. You know, if if you don't hunt, Mike, mm-hmm. and I do, and I want to take you out, I can be your hunter mentor, and you can come hunting with me. And in Wyoming, you can do that one time. You where you wouldn't have to take hunter safety uh, at that point, and you you still have to have a license. You still have to buy a license, but you could go out hunting as long as you're with an apprentice or a mentor, and you wouldn't need hunter safety. It's okay. a it's a recruitment tool trying to get you into. It. But you yeah. can do it only that one time. After that one time, if you want to go back, you got to take hunter safety. Mm-hmm. In some states, it it might be, I'd say one time, one year. Okay. Um, in some states, it might be for three years. Well, West Virginia is saying, we're not going to put any limitations on this. If you want to go with a mentor 10 years in a row, you can do that. Hmm. You got to be with that mentor, but you can do that, which is, it's just really, it's making it a lot easier to get into hunting. Right? That's kind of the idea behind it. Will it pass? I don't know, but it's a unique, I mean, it's an interesting bill to try and address some of these recruitment and retention issues and some of the some of the challenging burdens of you know, if you need to set aside a big block of time to take hunter safety, <laughs> which you do. It was long. It's yeah. a long, it's a block of time. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, let you do it on your own time. You know, figure out when, when you have the time to do it and do it. And if you don't want to do it, apparently you don't have to, as long as you're with somebody that did and, and have that mentorship. Hmm. You want an update? Yeah, you, yeah. you got something. We, he had to work. Okay, pretty everybody. Hard to here's to... well, it's crazy because everybody needs to understand this is how fast these things move. And so the the bill changed significantly, and so from the original version that we talked about, that was kind of that trade of access for numbers. Now there's it doesn't appear now that in the version that is it currently exists, which is uh, has amendments to they call it ER one sixty, right? We're talking about the same bill. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't appear that the current version has the requirement for providing access, and it did add the five dollars on here. Oh, uh-huh. so, so the, the, the media got it. Right. The reporter got it right. Uh-huh. So the reporter got the reporter it right. Got so it's, it right. just a, it's just a change where it, it, it started out looking like it was this trade, so you, right? Yeah. So access. you talked about what it was, and this is the sausage making process that it yeah. goes through. Yeah. Where well, at least a, this is as of last week, and yeah. it could change again. Yeah. Yep. And this is as of the 11th. So right now, February 11th, just so we yeah. make sure we get everybody on the same page right now, the proposal with amendments where we're sitting to, as we record this today, yep. it would be, there's not a trade for access. No, nope. you could get up to four additional licenses yep. for $5 and it is the a different piece. States. So it's limited, limited to four permits to hunt deer during the three days of Saturday through Monday, immediately preceding the opening day of firearm deer hunting season. So it went from seven days to three days. Uh, and then, um, the fee for each permit under the subsection shall be five dollars. So somebody in the legislature said it can't be free; it needs to be five bucks. Does Does anybody know if that's during a archery season there? Oh, now we're getting into I have no way idea. into the weeds. I'm just just think about it though. You you suddenly if you're, oh, you're, if you're setting archery, rifles out during a ri- an yeah, archery you're, season. You're, well, I mean it's on private land, right? So this should be regulated, and this should be fine because right. it's the land of Oklahoma. But just interestingly you're, you're enough, you're out with archery equipment, and you're 
you're doing what yeah. you need to do, and suddenly you hear rifles going off. Right. That's going to send up the hairs yep. on the back of my neck. Uh, it would, for sure. So here's a ridiculous, um, a challenging issue on this one. <laughs> so of those four permits, only two can be issued to somebody who's less than 19 years old. And only two can be issued to somebody who's, <laughs> and two must be issued to somebody who's 19 years old or older. So we're not re- we're not encouraging youth hunting here. No, so it's, you have to have, two of them can go to kids, two of them can go to adults, but you can't do all of them one way or the other. Hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know the policy ramifications behind that. I'm not going to even speculate on why they've landed there. But what what I will say is this, this was this was a worthwhile discussion even though it extended way longer than we intended to on this because at first I I thought, "Oh man, Nephi, you you pulled up the bill. Uh, and, this and reporter was, was totally was right, wrong." And you were right. Right. But we're both right. But we're given both our right own and, time stamps. and wrong based on the timestamp, right? So yeah, yeah, they change people. But that's Bills a change. But that's a good lesson here for how quickly things can change because this is just a matter of days. Uh, and I'd say it's a totally different bill than it was. It sounds like it. It absolutely sounds like it. Uh, you've taken out the access piece for sure. Anyway, uh, keep your eyes on Nebraska. That's an interesting concept uh, floating around out there, uh, and. <sighs> Like we just said at the very beginning, you never know. If something like that passes, it could be adopt by, adopted by another state. Um, the the last – we're probably to the point where it's probably worth talking about the very last thing. Okay. We're in Wyoming, right? So I think it makes sense to to talk about a couple of Wyoming bills. I know you had one you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Senate Joint uh, and I had, and Joint then, Resolution 1, Hunters Ed in Schools. Okay, so you have one you want to talk about, then I have one I want to talk about. The, and just and so I we're clear, say, you want to talk about one that there's a very good chance this one passes. Yep. I want to talk about one that already died. And okay. I'll, then I'll tell and you why. Just make sure, Nephi, about. you explain what a joint resolution is versus not. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so... The joint resolution means it's it's is a statement of policy and direction by the legislature who is saying we want this is the way it should be, but it's different than passing a law that says you're going to do exactly this. Right. And so what this is is Wyoming. Um, it's it's saying that the game and fish the the legislature says to game and fish you should work with the um, the superintendent of public instruction to make available to to encourage a program of for delivering hunter safety as an as a uh as an elective PE credit in Wyoming schools and that's because if you look at the way laws work and who has control over the different um you know the uh you know education in within local you know you look at local school boards and all this other stuff it gets really challenging to say everybody is going to do this versus we're going to encourage and so what this is is a resolution um, to in, to basically encourage the development of a hunter safety program that would be – that kids could go to in school for a PE elective. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is just absolutely awesome. It just makes the opportunity available and encourages the local the, – the, encourage the state-level school leadership to work with the local-level school leadership – to make it happen. Now, is it only for high schools, the idea to be elective PE for high school, or does it go to the middle school level? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, But I would say that, you know, Wyoming is looking at doing this and I think it passes. It's not the only state that's doing stuff like this. South Dakota also, I'll roll them in and say that South Dakota has a program and also funding for, um, for actually shooting sports in the high schools, which is an exciting thing too. Um, there are some states like Minnesota that are already doing that, but this is an example of state government recognizing the importance. You know, we talk about recruitment, retention, reactivation. The reality is if people don't start, it's just like camping. If people don't start when they're teenagers and doing this type of stuff when they're kids, teenagers, it's really harder to get adults into these types of programs if they don't get a taste of them when they're when they're youth. Mm-hmm. And so this is just an opportunity. This is, this is a way that states are investing in the future of hunting and the shooting sports. Okay. I've got no problems with it. That's I would, awesome. yeah, I never would have done it personally because I'd already taken hunter safety in elementary school. Uh, so it was pretty I unlikely. Of, I had a lot of friends in high school that they, they did it as a night school. It yeah. was at my high school. Uh, and they all went in together and did it. But so something like that sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. And you know, anything that, that, 
makes it easier to get that certification done so you can get out there. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I want to end with, probably should have ended with that. That's a good, that's a feel good one. I'm going to end with one that really kind of depress us. Yeah. It kind of annoyed me. So I, like I said, I, I wanted to talk about a bill that died. You're probably wondering why in the world would you it died? Why would you talk about it? Well, like we mentioned before, sometimes bills die and get new life in, you know, year after year and iteration after iteration, and then ultimately gain that momentum to pass. It can take a number of years sometimes to pass something. So I think it's worth bringing this up. It's the first time I've seen it here. Uh, I don't, I, I know that it's done in a couple of other states, there are iterations of this, but here's, the, here's what happened with this bill. So if you live in a Western state, it probably, this is probably the case for any state, but I'm going to speak specifically to Western states. If you live in a Western state, right, we're pretty protectionist about our states and the wildlife in it. Yeah, there's this mindset that if it's in, if the wildlife's in Wyoming, by golly, we're Wyoming citizens. We, that should be ours to hunt. So part of this bill was addressing the allocation of resident versus non-resident licenses in the state. And the current allocation for for wildlife is set two ways, one of two ways, depending on the species. It's set either via statute directly, and it breaks, it, it breaks up the resident versus non-resident, or it's done through regulation. What this bill would have done is it would have done it all through statute for all big game, for all large animals. We, we would call them big and trophy game in Wyoming, but that would include, um, you know, anything from moose and sheep to elk, mule deer, pronghorn, you know, bison. Um, it would have changed the allocation to make sure that 90% of all available licenses went to residents and 10% went to non-residents. But then it went a little bit farther. It did two other things. One was it was going to raise the fees for non-resident licenses to become effectively, I think for everything except mule deer, they would have been the most expensive non-resident licenses in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other piece was for that 10% that would go to non-residents. The bill said 30% of those must go to a non-resident that hires an outfitter in the state. Right. Mind you, Wyoming already has a law that says if you're a non-resident and you're wanting to hunt in a, in a wilderness area, you have to have a resident guide or have an outfitter. Mm -hmm. right. Now it's saying for everywhere, if you get a, a, it would have said, if you get a license, 30% of those needed to go to people that hired an outfitter. So that's, that's what that bill said. And I guess I had a couple of problems with it the way it was written. And one is personal issues. No, they're not. I'm well, just kidding. You could, I could argue it's a personal <laughs> issue. Uh, I'm just kidding. So on the 90, 10, alloc <laughs> on the 90, 10 allocation, I guess it's a personal issue, but it's also a public policy issue on the allocation question. When you dive into the budget of the state game and fish agency, and this is true for, uh, for agencies around the country. I, I love this. And let me preface what you're about to say. Yeah, with, like okay. you and I argued about this on the, or not argue. We just talked about it. And I was just laughed because I was like, this sounds like the opposite of what Dave would want initially, because like what Dave would want is the, more tags for Dave. Yeah. The, right. The duality of the situation. Right. Yeah. I, 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 like <laughs> like the conflict that you ran I'm into. Just a gigantic conflict, right? Yeah. Because you're right. You know, Hunter Dave wants the best chance possible to draw the best tag possible. And so, so on like, its yeah, face, take, take all those non-resident tags yeah. and put them in my pot. On, yeah. On its face, this allocation switch works out great for me. Right. So I should love it. But you get an additional half percent chance. Right. But, <laughs> but which so what's, makes the, all, what's the funding, but issue? dig into it a little bit. And there are two things. So it's the funding issue. Cause you'll know the other part about me and we'll get to that in a second. But, uh, <laughs> uh Here's the funding the issue. Overriding <laughs> issue. Yeah. Like this is, yeah, this right? is the most important thing for you yeah. is. So when you dive into a, a state agency budget, we know that and we've talked about it a lot. These wildlife agencies are funded primarily by license sales and Pittman Robertson dollars uh, from excise taxes. Look at the license sale piece, that component. And in Wyoming, about three times as much revenue is generated from license sales by non-residents than residents. Mm. So one is if you're going to change the allocation, it's going to cost the agency money and you've got to figure out how to make up 
that difference somewhere. Who are you going to have to charge? And how much are you going to have to charge to make up the lost revenue? Now, here comes the piece of the self-serving part of, <laughs> of me. You're gonna the have to reason charge. I like non-resident hunters is because they subsidize my experience. <laughs> They pay so much for their tags yeah. that it allows my tags to be cheaper. And if all things are being equal, it's not with Dave because it's money. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> money I is take more important than opportunity. Than opportunity. <laughs> Cheap licenses are better than that half a chance, half a percent chance of drawing something. Uh, yeah. So, so that's yeah, so people don't think about that. What it would do is like literally it would defund because of the. And I a lot of people have concerns about this. They would say there's an inequity in the cost of these tags. It's not fair. If you're coming from out of state, you're like, hey, that's not fair. I have to pay so much more. But if you're in state, what you have to realize is you take those folks out of the picture, like those folks really are lifting. They're doing a huge amount of lift. Well, and it's more than three the tag, times, too. The amount. Yeah. And so now when you say three, not three times, times the cost that's, of the tag, it's three times the total, total revenue. Uh, revenue. Yeah. So you're not talking about, oh, it's, it's not like it's my a tag, $300 for theirs. No. Exactly. No, it's the total, total revenue. Total revenue. And, and they make a, a much smaller percentage of the hunters. But they're also yeah. the ones that tend to get the hotels. Right. You know, so coming in front of town. So that's the other thing. You change the allocation yeah. and you cost the state the state itself millions of dollars of economic impact by reducing – even by reducing the number of tags by 5%. You're talking about a multi-million dollar impact on local economies from non residents that are no longer coming sure. to the state. Well, but with any bill, there's always balancing of things. Right. And so – so you were mentioning something about there was a, a component in it re requiring outfitters or guides. Yes. And yeah. the idea with that component was – the idea was uh, – I my understanding from listening in the hallways is that they, you were like, oh, we have this sweetener because if we want outfitters and guides to be okay with this, then what right, we have to do is – Because they get their revenue from non-residents. Yes. So what we have to do is we have to make it so that the guys that really take it in the shorts are the non-guided out-of-state hunters – those are the people that really would have been frozen out in this because we would have said, oh, we're going to guarantee the outfitters that they're still going to get X number of clients so it doesn't hurt them. We're just going to take the – it's going to be the – it's going to be the do-it-yourselfer yeah. from you know, Wisconsin who comes to hunt in Idaho that he takes in the shorts. So now let me give you this example because I read – I read this, it was a, and I can't remember what it was in. It might've been an American hunter. Um, it, it, I, I don't remember the publication. It was in a, a sporting publication. I probably shouldn't have mentioned the one cause I probably got it wrong. Yeah. But the author of this, uh, of this article was Andrew McKean. Andrew McKean is, I'm going to throw some props out. He's one of the co-hosts of the on gravel podcast whom we've had for reasons unbeknownst to me, some sort of a feud, but I think we've what, resolved what that. What, feud. what is it? What is it? It's a podcast. I I, I what, don't understand why called? somebody would somebody what, such, what called? why would such a good writer be on such a bad podcast? <laughs> no, no. I said we were putting that behind us. Oh, we're not no, talking. Sorry. We're not well, saying bad things. What was the name of the podcast? I don't remember anymore. Go ahead. Okay. Right. But oh, I was going to give great props to the author of this because what he laid out in this article uh, is a per perfect example of what could happen if a bill like this passes. Um, the some of the unintended consequences. So he was writing an article about point creep. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He was making the case that he's been buying points in Wyoming for however long he has for moose, 15 years, 17 years, something like that, at about $150 a point. Mm -hmm. And he was making the case that you know, by the time he would draw the tag, with all the money he invests in points and then having to buy the license on top of that, he it, it would make more financial sense to just today pay for an outfitted trip in Canada or Alaska uh, for moose. Mm -hmm. Now, if so, he goes through this process of spending all this money on points and gets to 22, 23 points and finally draws and then finds out that, well, the law changed. You drew, but now you're one of that 30% in order. If you want to, if you want to use this tag, you've got to hire an, yeah, an so outfitter. How do, so how do they, how, how was it? I didn't read the bill. So how, how were they proposing to make it so that the 30% of the outfitters they, they were coming punted, in? They punted to the department to write regulations. Oh, write regulations to figure out how they how were going to gonna require yep. 30%. Yep. To, okay. Anyway, I, I just think of that type of example of all the non-residents that have been contributing to conservation in the state by buying points. Mm -hmm. And they get, they've been doing this for a decade or almost two decades, and they're getting real close to being able to go on that hunt. And then this turd of a bill drops in their lap, and they find out, uh-oh, 
not only now I've invested all this money, now I'm going to be required to hire an outfitter to do that hunt and that I was planning on doing as well, a that, DIY. That's really interesting because, I mean, you got to – Nephi was talking about how that was going to be bad for outfitters, but there was an attempt to try to make it good for outfitters, and there's – there's all kinds of. I'd be interested to hear from an outfitter on that. You know, right? Well, what, what are their pers- perspectives? They on didn't it? support the. They bill. They did not. They walked in and opposed the bill. Everybody yes. uh, almost universally opposed that bill. So mm. it it died, and maybe it won't come back. I just bring it up because it's an example of a. So of next a, time, Dave, you're mad at the outfitters <laughs> for some rule or reg that they have in place. You just remember what they did. That's right. To save your pocketbook. That's right. They allowed non-resident to continue to subsidize my and my That's hunting right. enjoyment. Yeah. Thank and you, I Lee Livingston. That. I appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I only bring that up because it's an example of a bill that if it got any legs, I could see other states adopting something similar to that. Uh, and some states do have outfitter allocations. Um, and it, it's just, it's one of those things we have to watch carefully is all I'd say. Um, anyway, that's all I've got. There are tons more bills floating around there in states. If you got, if you got example bills you want us uh, to look at, send us an email, your mountain at it's your uh, or, you know, hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at the handle at it's your mountain. Uh, let us know. Uh, we're going to monitor the best we can. Some of these bills that are going on around the country, maybe we'll touch on a few more here before sessions adjourn uh, in various places. Um, but we, it's, it's an interesting topic because there's, you know, we're talking about bills that from all over the country. And uh, like we said at the beginning, it's interesting how some of these bills can, can be picked up by other States. So one quick ask for our listeners as you're out there before you go and sign up for our podcast and give us great reviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, we'd appreciate hearing from some of you honestly about an issue, which is this, um, as we sit down here in our echo chamber, the three of us and talk about these issues, um, we also have episodes with guests weigh in and tell us what the value is to you of, you know, the different types of podcasts and, 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 and help us understand if we're getting the mix right, if you'd like to us to talk more with guests about subjects or also please weigh in as we sit down for these policy dives and tell us, do you like these or don't you? Because we want to produce podcasts that are meaningful to you. And I know that we have listened to podcasts where we think like folks, some of them have gotten into echo chambers that we listen to. And you just kind of hear the same thing over and over again in the same voices. And you're like, eh, what's the value of that? We don't want to be that podcast. And so tell us if we're doing right by you as a listener and how we can improve. We'd really appreciate it. Yeah, that's a good point. I, th- I'm i glad you said that, Nephi, because we really are open to all suggestions on on you know how to deliver the content you want. And we don't want folks like Chris Timus and you know, driving off the road because they were falling asleep during yeah. one of our podcasts because they just found the topic to be you know something they weren't interested in. So, uh, help us out, really help us out because we're doing this. F- I mean, it sounds we'll give you the content cliche, that you want. Right? We promise. We'll yeah, try. we sound cliche, right? But we're doing this for all of you. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to do our best to get you the content you want. So yeah, feedback is greatly appreciated. Of course, right after you send that, then go to iTunes and give us that five star review and yes. you know ranking and review, and because you know we need our yep. egos need that. Real and the badly. reason you should do that is because we actually care what you think. We do care, unlike other podcasts. No, they probably care too. We all mm, care. No, they just but uh, they're fake. But please do it. Yeah, we that this would mean real. a lot to us, um, and we really do appreciate hearing from everybody. You guys have anything else? No. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. We'll catch you next week, and remember that life is about experiences, so go have one.